Welcome to Classroom 5.0, a podcast that uncovers industry insights, cutting edge research and practical evidence-based strategies that help us all to imagine and design learning environments and pathways for this ever-evolving world so that together we can best support the next gen to uncover and deliver their unique potential. This episode has been recorded from our hometown of Port Macquarie, which we're grateful to share and enjoy alongside the traditional owners of Beer Pie Country, whose ongoing cultures and connections to lands and waters we celebrate, and whose elders, past, present and emerging, we pay our respect to. Welcome back to Classroom 5.0. I'm your host, Marianne Power, psychologist and co-founder at the Posify Group. And today I am being joined by Sharon, who is the founder of The Functional family. A little bit more about Sharon. Sharon is a small business owner, coach, and mother to three boys. Her husband and her three sons all have severe ADHD. And so she's passionate about helping parents create home environments that are functional and joyful so that they can streamline their day-to-day tasks with innovative systems and routines that she shares with her families so that they can get back to the important things like enjoying the children These are all the reasons why Sharon founded The Functional Family. Sharon actually has a corporate background and a knack for organization, creating procedures and event planning that's allowed her to focus her time on assisting families that are struggling under the pressures of raising children, particularly those with D or anxiety. And as many of our listeners know, that pretty much describes my family. (laughs) So I'm really excited about this conversation. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, I might have gotten into the back end of your bio to see that you're also a bit of a raving cook. Tell us a little bit about that. What's your favorite recipe to prepare? Oh, thank you, first of all. (laughs) But I love anything that is going to make it easier for future families. So I like anything that you can oh. freeze, hide vegetables in, um, things that are going to make, like I love I love a spaghetti bolognese where I can hide lots of veggies in there. Oh, yeah. Like shepherd's pie, anything that I can put in the freezer for those nights where it just doesn't go to plan, you've got a bit mm-hmm. of a meal ready to go. I love that sort of stuff. That Anything that the kids will eat that I can hide stuff in. I'm a bit of a vegetable ninja in, you know, sneaking things into their diet. <laughs> A vegetable ninja. Oh my goodness. You've already said so many things. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun. Okay. So future self. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm constantly thinking about what would Marianne's future self like right now. Um, I love that. I love that you're hiding veggies and I love that you're thinking about tomorrow and, and making prepping and planning because, you know, the simple task of cooking dinner for most people seems like a simple task, but for us with ADHD, it can be a little bit overwhelming. What do you find when you're working with families around um, those daily tasks like cooking that works well in terms of organization that you could share with us all today? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think that uh, when it comes to when you've got a high intensity household with ADHD, like we've got ADHD, Tourette's, ODD, SPD going on in our house, um, I think yeah, that wow. anything that can make your life easier is something that we should all fun- uh, focus on because, you know, it's not the, the big meltdowns and things that suck all your energy. It's those day to day tasks that suck so much of your energy. Like if you mm. know that every time, every day, at this time of day, in that witching hour that we call it, <laughs> Um, that there's going to be lots of blow-ups and it's a high-intensity time for your household as you're trying to cook dinner and the kids are fighting and you've got to get them in the shower and um, you've got all these things going on and that is a sucky time of day for your family, then we've got to look at mm. like things that are going to make it easier for your family at that time. So anything that um, we can use, any strategies that we can use to make those times a day easier, then I will always um, be all about. So looking at those times of days as a point of friction and then creating some framework around it to make it a little bit easier. So things like using the power of habit, I think is really, really important for the ADHD brain. Um, So Mm. I don't like to call them routines as much as I like to call it that power of habit. Um, So in talking about food and and meal prep, because I know that that can be a tricky time of day and a tricky thing for um, lots of families as we have after school activities and bits and pieces. So I would always recommend to just have having a rotating meal plan I just do it every fortnight we have the same things going on on rotation so then the grocery shop becomes easy we can just online order it it's the same you create a list in Woolworths you've just tick off the stuff you already have Um, it gets delivered to your door taking out that 
that component of taking kids with, um, you know, to the supermarket. It's never a good time for my family. Um, mm -hmm. Automate as much as you can, like that grocery shop, that meal plan, having a system. We actually stepped yeah. up for it, um, at the functional family to make it super easy, just so everyone knows what to expect and uh, and you can take some of the hard yards out for you. So if it's something like spaghetti bolognese, which I mentioned before, double it so the second week you don't have to do it. <laughs> um, so you yeah. can double your amounts and make anything easier for your future self. Yes, I love that. And sometimes just simplifying it to those little reminders or those little memos in your mind of, of thinking about your future self can be so helpful. And I should backtrack because I've launched on in because I'm just keen to hear these strategies. But for our listeners, they're like, hang on a second, Maz. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are we talking about? ADHD, neurodivergence, tics, Tourette's, whoa, whoa, whoa. So for our listeners who aren't familiar, neurodivergence kind of, I guess, sums up the idea that we've got different types of brains or different minds, or you might have heard the saying that some brains are wired differently. And we know in the population around 20% of people uh, would identify as neurodivergent or have a clinical diagnosis. And so when Sharon and I are talking today about ADHD and different neurodivergent, specifically speaking to those neurodivergent profiles that pop up from childhood and into adulthood. But um, Sharon, you know, this was my experience and I'm sure you've also had families where the children in the family, first and foremost, have come with a diagnosis of ADHD, but then all of a sudden one of the parents is like, oh interesting. I'm noticing a lot of those features in myself <laughs> and perhaps go and get a later diagnosis. What are you noticing about actually, I, I should backtrack this. I have to share. I always find it kind of funny that it's up to me to organize my neurodivergent children when I also have those exec executive functioning struggles. So what are you noticing about the ripple effect of empowering families and parents who also might be ADHD and neurodivergent themselves with these strategies and skills and how does that impact their families? I think um, one of the things that I've noticed the most from working with, uh, so first of all, what you said about the, the children getting the diagnosis and then perhaps one of the parents or maybe both the parents going, Oh, that sounds a lot like me. And, yeah. uh, and then going back and getting a diagnosis themselves. <laughs> that is a really common scenario. Um, so much so that I started, started tailoring what we do at the functional family to also cater for the adult ADHD brain because, uh, so that was such a common thing that was happening. Mm. Um, not just for, uh, you know, parents caring for their children after strategies to help uh, with their children, but also help themselves. And one of the uh, biggest feedbacks, uh, biggest piece of feedback that I got is that they that people um, with ADHD as adults missed out on some of the, the they missed out on some of the life skill stuff. Yeah. Um, so they perhaps were struggling with you know staying on top of laundry, staying on top of meal planning, staying on top of paying bills, staying on top. You know, they, there's life. They were so good at the things that they were passionate about. You know, mm. they had these beautiful zones of genius and stuff that their brain was just so incredible at. But it was the boring, mundane stuff that was just sucking all their energy all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and they were after life skill strategies um, to, that worked with their ADHD brain so they could get that stuff done easily without it sucking all their energy. Uh, so that was one mm. of the brilliant things that came out of it. And that's one of the reasons why it's called the functional family, because I'm all about that executive function. <laughs> I, like, I like making that stuff easier um, and making, you know, Focusing on making families functional rather than, you know, making them social media worthy. Like they're never going to be perfect. Like, you know, um, like people mm. have this idea in their head about what that ridiculous perfect family that doesn't exist is like. Um, but mm. making things easier, making it function better, streamlining day-to-day -day tasks, making things, um, you know, less taxing, specifically on um, the, that primary caregiver, because, you know, you only have to look around at some of the most, uh, all the families that are in our beautiful communities here, and you can see that some of the parents are, are a lot of the parents are really exhausted. Yeah, it's it's stressful. Day-to-day -day drudgery things that we need to make it easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you spoke to that sort of effort reward issue a little bit earlier about, you know, the big meltdowns, that there's a perception that that's the tough stuff. And you've got your own neurodivergent family. I mean, I definitely resonate with that. It's the little things that add up to the stress because those little things that, you know, the dopamine's like, I don't really want to do the dishes today, but I'm really interested in what struggle you had and let's find a solution because that's where my genius zone works from. But for you, um, you know, because Sharon, I, I don't think, do you have a diagnosis of ADHD? I saw that your husband does, but you don't, do you? So you would fit into no, our- No, I don't. 
neurotypical friends. Yeah. So those of our yes. neurotypical Although friends I who are listening. I question things myself at some stage. <laughs> but, but no, my husband um, definitely has, uh, he had quite a horrific time growing up with ADHD. He was uh, mm. pretty much banned from the classroom. This is, you know, wow. 80s and 90s and, you know, early 80s and 90s where ADHD wasn't really, uh, wasn't really, t- you know, t- understood properly mm, uh, mm. he was banned from the past he fought his way through school he never got invited to a birthday party because he was the naughty kid yeah uh, and he had a really horrific time and had a lot of had a lot of wounds in relation to growing up with ADHD and so mm. when my first son was diagnosed I had heard my husband's awful um, trauma in relation mm. to growing up with ADHD and I looked at my gorgeous little boy who I kn- knew instinctively that something was going on for because um, mm. he's very the same as my husband. They're like two peas in a, in a little pod, oh. my eldest and my husband. And I just thought, oh, I can't have this be the story for Xavier. I can't have this. Yeah. I can't have him have the same experience that Anthony had growing up. Uh, and that's where we started looking at things to change the experience for Xavier and, and, and subsequently my two other little boys as well because mm. uh, I, wanted, I wanted him to look back at, he, at him, uh, his experience growing up and feel differently about it to what my husband um, had felt. Mm, that's such a beautiful, heartfelt motivation. Thank you for sharing that. Hey there, I wanted to tell you about an exciting and innovative solution we've been designing to help solve this problem of how we best prepare the next gen for an ever-evolving world and future workforce that's going to demand a whole new set of skills and mindsets in order for them to thrive. The POSIFY Academy is Australia's first student-led, evidence-based and curriculum-aligned wellbeing and career development platform, helping young people aged 10 to 14 uncover and deliver their unique potential. It's the first of a trilogy series that's helping young people move seamlessly and with confidence from education and into industry as they design a life and a career of impact. Teaching skills like communication, compassion, creativity, critical thinking, agility, curiosity, resilience, problem solving, all those human capability skills that we talk about here on this podcast and connecting them with a sense of purpose. To learn more, you can visit theposifygroup.com.au forward slash posify dash academy. Now back to the show. And, and to speak to those sort of moments of of the struggle in the meltdowns and the overwhelm, what's it like in your house? Like where do you find that that kicks in and, and is challenging and difficult? And in what way does the organization support you? When I was experiencing the boys growing up and they're all uh, various different ages with different things going on, um, it was that day-to-day exhaustion that I was finding quite challenging. Um, Mm. There's a lot going on with um, you know, managing the boys, uh, having a, ha- you know, being able to get them out of the door in the morning to get them to school, um, getting them to bed at night time. There was all these dramas. It was just a very um, a house full of stress and conflict. I would say. sounds like and chaos. It definitely wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. chaos. It was a nice yeah. way of saying it's very yeah. chaotic, and it was full of conflict. No one was emotionally regulating. I was just burning out um, yeah. as, a, as a mother because there's just so much energy and um, often aggression and intensity in our household that it was just becoming very, very overwhelming. And for me, it really took me getting quite sick. I couldn't, I was buckling under the pressure of, um, I developed an autoimmune disease. Um, wow. You know, living in a, such a stressful environment uh, mm. that I had, to, I was out of survival. I instinctively knew I had to make it easier for our, for our whole family, not just I was yeah. prior to that, I was focusing all my attention on Xavier and making it easier for him. But mm. I really wanted to make it easier for the whole family and make sure the whole family could work together a bit easier, uh, you know, more, more harmoniously, I would say, um, mm. because I, I noticed that we were all not enjoying each other's company. We were mm. all battling all the time like there was so much conflict and I just thought there had to be an easier way so I started researching and studying the ADHD brain and I love a policy and procedure this is what <laughs> this is what I used to do for my old job yeah and so I started conducting experiments on my family wow. so I would uh, it's it's kind of funny when I look back at it now but at that time I was doing it out of pure survival so yeah. I would say mess up a room and get 
I then see what happens when all the boys walk into it and sit, watch their body language, see what happens. Um, I know that when things are chaotic, my husband just wants to get out of the room, so he'll go out to the backyard. I was watching the, the boys' um, body language. They'd have clenched fists and things like that. And then I'd run the same experiment the next day, but I'd have it in a minimalist room, and I'd document what was happening. So I was actually wow, having these Wow, you're, like, doing your own, own total – yeah, I love that. And what did you find? The inner geeky oh, scientist wants to know. A lot. Yes. I was yeah. I learned a lot that they could cope better, even yeah. though they didn't say they wanted order and have it. They could cope a lot better when they knew what was expected, when things mm. were clear, when there was a really um, clear boundary about what was happening. Uh, mm. and that and when basically things had an organisational system behind it. Um, yeah. And so nothing too – it wasn't complex. It was just about creating framework for my family so it could operate better. And once mm. everyone knew what was expected and they started modelling some of their behaviour of what I was doing and copying what I was doing in terms of, um, you know, some of the systems and procedures, it just became easier. And we yeah. still have meltdowns, blow-ups, conflict, you know, all that sort of stuff. But now it just doesn't feel so overwhelming because the everyday yeah. tasks that were sucking all my energy out all the time are done a lot. Like they, they just get done quite quickly and smoothly and without mm. constant conflict with every step that you're take, that I was taking. Um, so there was a lot of experiments, a lot of research, a lot of trial and error, a lot of spectacular failures. Uh, but I documented everything. And it was really, really just to help my family at that point. It wasn't about anyone else's. Um, and I started put, putting visuals everywhere, using, using visual cues and little codes for things. And and, uh, and until one day I had a girlfriend come over to the house and she's like, oh, my God, you need to share some of this stuff. You need, yeah. to, you need to help other families with this. Yeah. And so that's when I started thinking, oh, okay, how can I help others? Because I knew a lot of our friends have kids with ADHD and, and um, you know, and, and things going on as well. And I thought, oh, this might be able to help them. So uh, I, that's when I started thinking about putting it together as a program to share with others and, uh, and you know, obviously study ADHD and, and, and launch something that could help other families as well. Oh, gosh. And, yeah. So grateful. What can I say? And it's interesting because I know on your website, you say you're trying to avoid the psychobabble. And, you know, as a psychologist, I'm like, oh, man, yeah, look, our industry does do that a little bit. Um, and I'm not doing that intentionally for this episode with you, by the way, because I saw that. But um, <laughs> it, it's interesting because when, you know, you talk about that that task organization and those visual cues, you know, there's all sorts of science-backed research as to why that's really helpful and supportive of a neurodivergent brain. Um, and you know, just being able to provide a little bit of a tunnel vision um, for these kids and our families. Yeah. And to your point, to, to leave room and leave space for the stuff that actually matters. You know, it's really difficult to, to front on a conflict or an important conversation or get a project done if your attention is being diverted by all of the shiny colours in the room because of the mess and the chaos. Um, and yet, as a neurodivergent person, it's also really challenging oftentimes without having someone hold your hand to put those systems and places in order. So as somebody who is trying to automate more of their own life, I am very grateful the work that you're doing. <laughs> oh, and so speaking about uh, managing all the juggle, uh, a lot of the families that we work with, both through Posify and then, of course, um, where I run my clinical practice as well, and we're about to launch Messy Magic, which I'm going to put in the show notes. But one of the challenges that we have is a lot of our families um, often run their own businesses as well as trying to manage their households. Um, and when neurodivergence is in the mix, that's really challenging. What sort of tips or what sort of things are you noticing in terms of the modern work juggle as we start to have our lives, our, our families, and our works kind of more integrated and more hybrid now more than ever? I think it's really important to, you know, try and set your hours because mm. I think that as we all sort of look at working from home and we've got emails and we've got social media and we've got things popping up all the time, um, it's really easy to think that we're multitasking. We're getting lots of things done um, at once. We're like we're doing mm. like half cooking dinner and we're half spending time with the kids, but we're also half replying to an email and we're half doing like all these things like that. And it's it's not always an effective use of our time. Uh, mm. I know that the, the brain actually can't multitask. We just can swap things from one thing to the other. 
Um, and mm. it feels like we're doing a lot, but are we actually doing it as quickly or as easily as possible? Um, I like mm. to work in blocks. So I'm quite um, good, like I'll just set myself a little timer, um, 30 yeah. minutes of replying back to emails, Th 30 minutes. And if I'm with my kids, I'm trying to go all in with my kids. If I'm mm. resting, I'm not going to watch Netflix and feel guilty about not doing else. I'll go all in on that Netflix, <laughs> you know, like try and yeah. only do one thing at a, at a time. This, this big multitasking myth that we have just burns us out. So I try and just focus on whatever I'm doing at that particular time. Um, having those, uh, you know, those little, uh, Clocks, I use the sand timers a lot, the hourglass yeah. timers. Um, I've got all different ones from Amazon and I just flick it over and I go, hey, we're just going to do this for this amount of time. And I use it a lot for the kids as well. Some some kids' timers stress them out, but for, for these sorts of things, I say, look, we're going to clean up, but we're only going to clean up for five minutes. Let's just see what we can get done in this five minutes. And so I it love takes that, that pressure out of it. Let's just, yeah, let's just see what we can get done in this time. And I've got these multicolored timers. We flick them over. Let's just take the pressure out. We'll just whatever gets done in this five minutes, that's cool. But we're all going to do it for this five minutes. Um, and that that's kind of a nice little way of, of um, you know, getting your brain engaged. It's taking the pressure out of it, but we're, we're just going to make a little bit of a game out of it as well. Um, so mm. working, working in blocks, trying not to multitask, having systems in anything. So if anything is a... a um, if something is a, is a common problem, we call it a predictable problem. So if something Ooh. that you're doing every day, say, for example, um, my little one, Harvey, getting dressed, it's a predictable problem. He has a problem every day with it. He doesn't like the feel of socks. He doesn't like the feel of underpants. He doesn't like anything. Um, so if that's a predictable problem, then that's when we would look at it from an outsider perspective, like take the emotion out of it and remove yourself from that problem that you face every day and that predictable problem and think, okay, from like almost like putting a CEO hat on, what could I do to make this easier for myself, make it easier for Harvey every morning? Is there mm. something that we can be doing? Is it something as simple as laying the clothes out the night before? Is it something as simple as, you know, maybe adding some time, to, like a timer to it? Is it something as easy as having a little reward after he gets dressed in the morning? Is there is there mm. a way that I can say to him, let's do it together to take up, you know, to body double with him so he can get dressed um, e easily? Is there something that I can be doing to trial it? It doesn't always work, but is there something I can be doing to make that point of friction a little bit easier for ourselves each day? Um, so mm. the same goes with, you know, running a business. Is there, you know, if you're coming up against something every day that's a predictable problem, like maybe mm -hmm. it's that you, as soon as you turn on your computer, you get distracted by your emails every day. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's about doing a solid block, maybe a 30-minute block or a 90-minute block, depending on what your, um, you know, what your brain likes to do. Um before you open that email, those emails every morning so you don't get mm. sucked into everyone else's agenda, you get some of your tasks done first. Is there something that you can do to make those predictable problems, if they're coming up again and again each day, a little bit easier for yourself? Uh, and, you know, just, just knowing what you're struggling with and knowing what you're good at um, and mm. just creating a little bit of framework around what you what you're struggling with, so that you don't have to bang your head against the brick wall every day and think, "Oh, wow, I still didn't get to that. I didn't get that bit done again." Um, yeah. You know, it, maybe there's some other things that we can be doing to make it easier for ourselves each day. Yeah, and gosh, you've just reminded me. I mean, one of the things that I first do with clients and of families who are looking at ADHD and how to best make use of that time and to your point to sort of close that gap on performance because it's such a such a frustration with knowing that you had all these big ideas you wanted to achieve and feeling like you haven't had that sense of accomplishment we know for well-being that that is so important but often it's it's looking at well what is this person's relationship with time you know where is their time blindness if there is any what's their time wisdom like do they mm. have a sense of understanding of how long it's going to take to get dressed have a shower do the emails, whatever it is. Um, so I love that you're recommending time chunking and, and really breaking those things down and using visual cues with kids. I'm going to throw lots of different ideas into the show notes, but. Oh, I was just going to say when it comes to, you know, when you've got tasks for the ADHD brain, yeah. you know how you hear the, the concept of people eating the frog. So that eating the frog mm. means you do the hardest task first. So for a neurotypical person, you know, you'd often have a list of things you've got to get done and you do the mm. hardest one first. So you feel that set of accomplishment, you get that one out of the way. For mm. the ADHD brain, I always say, do not eat Flip the it. frog. Flip yeah. it. Yeah. Flip so it. Do, give yourself quick wins. So yeah. if it's the same with your kids, um, give them some quick wins first. The things that get momentum, like, oh my gosh, yeah. you've done that already. 
you like well done like you know give them some quick wins before you start loading them with the hardest task so if you've got that they've got to do a project for school let them get a few quick wins under that do the easy part first um so do not eat the frog Absolutely. And I promised I wouldn't psychobabble, but I can't help myself now. <laughs> There's a real reason and theory behind that too, Sharon. I don't know if you've heard of Barbara Fredrickson's work with the upward spiral of, of positive positive theory. Okay. No, so no. basically her work looked at the idea of, you know, when you get those quick wins, you get that sense of achievement and, you know, for ADHD, that kicks off your dopamine circuitry and you go, woohoo, I got a win. And so you start your upward spiral of positivity. And so her theory helps us to understand why it's really important to get those quick wins on the board and how that can actually improve our motivation. So that's another one I'll share for any of the fellow <laughs> geeky scientists who like to have a look at how our brains work and why, and some good humans in the field who are contributing. Yeah, it's a really good point to flip that one, get the wins on the board. I like it. Sharon, you're doing such incredible work supporting families. Where can our listeners learn more about how you're, um, how to get involved in everything that you're doing? And, and maybe get some tips and tricks yes. under their own belt. Oh, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my website is www.thefunctionalfamily.com and uh, we've got lots of resources in there, including a really large private Facebook group where people can join via the website and, um, and give and receive support. Uh, it's a really great space, a really kind, caring space of beautiful families going through the same journey as um, mm. you know, your family might be going through. And uh, it's a lovely, kind community. Um, we've got free resources on there, blogs, um, tips on how to advocate for your child at school, uh, lots of really great resources on there as well. So I encourage people to check it out, join the Facebook group, get involved and, uh, and you know, become a part of this beautiful community. Oh, thank you, Sharon. And I'd, I'd be amiss by not asking you our favorite magic wand question to close out. Are you ready? This requires yes. a little bit of imagination. <laughs> if you were to wave a magic wand and able to change the world in one way, so the future world, and it looked different for your kids and for all the kids and for us all, what would you say? What would you change? I would give everyone a little bit more understanding and education about what it's like to be, um, you know, to have conditions or be neurodivergent. So we can have a little bit more understanding about what it what it's like to have ADHD, what it's like to have an ADHD brain, and just mm. a little bit more um, compassion and understanding, and you know, and be able to help support these beautiful people and beautiful families because their their brains are quite incredible and mm. i always think that sometimes we get uh caught up on what the struggles are but there's some amazing beautiful things um, that these gorgeous people can do and i'd love for people to be able to understand that a little bit better oh well, we share that hope and that vision so thank you for working towards creating your own impact in that space. Sharon, it's been such a pleasure to have you here. To all our listeners, thank you again for joining us for Classroom 5.0. We're so excited that this particular episode is then going to lean us into some more work we're doing with Messy Magic in 2023. So come and play with us there too. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Ne we will see you next time. <laughs> see you later, alligators. Classroom 5.0 is brought to you by The Fossify Group a socially conscious education company arming the next gen with a sense of purpose and the future skills they'll need to thrive in this ever-evolving world. Your ratings and reviews really mean the world to us. So if you loved this episode, please let us know and share it with a friend. We'd like to say thanks to our editing guru, Clint Brands, and his team at My Video Producer, who helped us put this show together and who have kindly sponsored season three of Classroom 5.0. And for today's show notes, links, and more episodes just like these, you can visit thepossifygroup.com.au forward slash podcast. Thanks for helping us imagine alive the future of learning, work, and leadership. We'll see you next time.